Every device that you connect to your Linux workstation is going to require some resources. It needs an interrupt setting. There are probably memory addresses and I.O. addresses that have to be configured. So it's useful to understand those resources and how Linux is able to take advantage of changing those resources dynamically when you install or remove a particular hardware device. This automation of automatically identifying a device that you add to a computer and having that computer automatically configure those settings is something called plug and play. Now to understand plug and play, it's useful if we go back to the times before your computers had this capability. And back in the day, there was a bus type called the ISA bus. We don't really see the ISA bus used any longer on our modern computers, but if you find a really old system, you may still see some ISA bus slots either on the motherboard, maybe even in use on that device. This ISA architecture was one where you configured everything there was to configure about the hardware resources of that particular adapter card or that particular hardware device that you're installing. So you had to manually configure, usually through jumpers or through switches on the card itself, the IRQ, the interrupt request on that particular device. You had to configure the IO addresses, the DMA settings. And once you added that device to your computer, you hoped that you weren't conflicting with anything else. After all, you were the one that had to manually configure that device and all of the other devices in your computer. So if you happen to create an interrupt conflict or you happen to use the same memory addresses as another device, you could have a problem with those devices working properly in your computer. That's why we came up with a brand new way of doing this called plug and play. Plug and play was introduced when we came out with a brand new architecture type called the PCI architecture. And that architecture was one that we've used going forward. And plug and play is something that also works on newer architectures as well. This came out in the late 1990s. And at the time, if you needed to take advantage of plug and play, you needed a computer that had a BIOS that would support plug and play. You needed a card, an adapter card, a device that you were connecting to your computer that understood the plug and play format and you needed an operating system that could also take advantage of that automation that was used with plug and play. Back when plug and play was introduced, those three things were sometimes hard to find. You had to be sure that you had all three of those for it to work. But on today's modern computers, it's hard to find a computer, a BIOS, a device that does not do plug and play. You can probably see the references to this in your BIOS. You might even see it referenced on most adapter cards. But these days, it's almost assumed that everything will be plug and play compliant. Whether you're running a plug and play architecture or one that is not plug and play, there are going to be times when you need to know what hardware is installed on this Linux device. And one way to do that is to go to the slash proc file system. This is not a real file system, although it looks exactly like a normal file system to us human beings. It's actually a virtual file system. It's the operating system making this information appear as if it were files. But these aren't really files that are stored in your hard drive. They're actually created dynamically when we begin accessing this data. If you go to this directory, you'll find a lot of different files. Here's a few of them. If you look at CPU info, it will show you information about the CPU that's inside of your Linux workstation. There's a module file. We'll talk about kernel modules in an upcoming video. That gives you information about what kernel modules happen to be loaded. You can look at version information. There's a file called bus that tells you about the PCI bus or the USB connectivity on your computer. There's a lot of great information inside of that slash proc file system. Here's my Linux workstation. If I look at the print working directory command, I see I am in slash proc. And if I perform an LS, it looks like there are a lot of files here. But this is, of course, that virtual file system. You'll see a lot of directories here for processes that are already running on this particular computer. They're this lighter color here. But there are also a number of other files. We mentioned some of those earlier. For instance, the CPU info. If I more the CPU info, You'll see a lot of details there about the processor. You can see the vendor ID information, the model, the model name, everything that you would ever want to know about the CPU. Let's do another one. I'll perform an LS again. And let's look at something like MEM info. That would be a good information to find out about what memory is inside of that computer. And you can see a lot of detail as we look at MIM info about all of the memory and how it's used by the Linux operating system. There are a lot of other files in here. If you want to go in and start looking around at the information that's in slash proc, 
you'll begin to learn a lot more about how your Linux device is configured. There's obviously a lot of different kinds of hardware inside of your computer, and they're all working in different ways. For instance, you probably have a storage device inside of your computer, and there's constant access in and out of that storage device. But there's also a keyboard connected to that computer, and the keyboard really doesn't do a lot of input or output unless we're typing on that keyboard. And then obviously, we do need to have access to the system. The way that your computer knows if a device needs any type of attention is through something called an interrupt request. That device sends a message to the CPU that says, excuse me, I need to get access to the CPU. I need to now perform some type of function on that computer. If I press a key on the keyboard, my keyboard sends an interrupt request to a controller who then gives my keyboard access to the system. And that way we're able to distribute the load across the systems that only need access at that particular time. These interrupts, especially in the older ISA architecture, use something called a programmable interrupt controller, a PIC and your keyboard or device that needed to interrupt your system would ask that controller for access. There were interrupts that were numbered 0 through 15. So you really only had 16 interrupts to be able to work with, and you couldn't share interrupts across different devices. Well, obviously, on our modern computers, we have a lot of different components inside of those. We need a lot more interrupts, and we need some way to perhaps even share those interrupts. So you'll find on motherboards that have PCI-based architectures that you have something called an advanced programmable interrupt controller, an APIC, and you can have much more than 16 IRQs inside of that. And you even have the ability to share IRQs if you need to. There's also a file that gives you information about this IRQ configuration. You'll find that in slash proc slash interrupts. We're back in my proc folder on my Linux device. There's the file called interrupts. And if I less that interrupts file, it's a very big file. So you'll want to paginate it by using less or more. And you can see in this file on the left side is the interrupt numbers themselves. I'm on a single CPU system. So you'll see the number of interrupts that have been asked for that particular CPU, the type of IRQ it happens to be, and then the device that is using that particular IRQ. And if I page through some of these, you can see there are a lot of IRQs available on my system, some of them that are in use by certain devices. And you can now break down exactly what devices have been assigned to which interrupts. Many hardware devices also need a hardware resource called an I.O. address that stands for Input Output Address. You may hear this referred to as port address or I.O. ports. It all means the same thing. This is really a mailbox that your device can use to exchange information with the CPU and the rest of the hardware inside of your computer. So you can have this particular address, like the address of your house, set aside when you need to send information out. You put that information in the mailbox. And eventually, your computer comes by and picks up that information. And when it needs to return information to you, it simply drops it off at your mailbox and lets you know there's some data waiting for you so that you can grab it out of the mailbox and then do something with that particular information. So obviously, every device that's going to exchange that data needs to have an address. It needs to have this mailbox. Some devices need a lot of room. Some mailboxes need to be very large. They're transferring very big parcels of information. Other devices may only need to send a little bit of information. So you may see a big address range set aside just for one particular piece of hardware. These addresses are hexadecimal. So if you list them out, don't be thrown by the fact that they're listed that way. That's a very common way to address memory locations. And then you can list out all of these in the slash proc IO ports file. Back in our proc directory, you can see the IO ports file it's right in front of us. Let's have a look at that IO ports file. And you can see the IO ports file has things that you might recognize in there. You can see on the right side things like keyboard. You can see DMA2, FPU, serial, parallel ports, things that we would recognize with pieces of hardware. And on the left side, you can see the range of memory addresses that have been assigned to that particular piece of hardware. So if you wanted to look through the file and you wanted to find out what memory address was being used by the audio system inside of my computer, you could scroll down all the way to the section that shows information that's on the PCI bus. And in fact, you can see the audio PCI that's on my computer and the exact memory address that you used to send that audio from the audio adapter into the computer and back again. 
Another important hardware resource is called the DMA, the Direct Memory Access Channel or the Direct Memory Access Bus, depending on what type of system you're running on. This allows your hardware devices to communicate directly to the memory of your computer without having to go through the CPU of your system. This obviously takes a load off your CPU, and it also increases the transfer rate of information because it doesn't have to go through the CPU to make that happen. So you usually see this when you're using using network adapter cards or storage devices, anything that's inside of your computer that needs a lot of throughput that needs to go as fast as possible. In our older ISA-based computers, we had physical DMA channels, separate channels that were configured between hardware and memory. And you could configure your devices to use a single DMA channel to talk to memory and have memory communicate back to that device. Those DMA channels were usually two separate controllers that had four channels on each of them. And there was one channel set up for on channel four that was used to cascade those two controllers between each other. Obviously, there are limitations there. If you had a lot of devices inside of your computer, you might have only had a limited number of DMA channels. So this may not have been the most scalable architecture. In the PCI architecture, we don't have separate channels any longer. We simply have a shared bus. And devices can take control of the bus, transfer their data, and then release control so that any other device can use that DMA bus to communicate directly to memory. On many systems, you'll also see backwards compatibility with those older ISA DMA channels, and you'll see those listed again as that channel 4 to cascade back to that older PCI DMA controller. If you'd like to see how the DMA is configured in your system, you can go to the PROC folder and look at the file DMA. I don't suspect there's a lot of devices on my computer that are using DMA, but if we wanted to see, we could look at the PROC folder and look at the file DMA. And on my computer, you can see there is only the DMA channel 4 that cascade back to those ISA devices. Hopefully, you can see that using that PROC folder can tell you a lot about the hardware inside of your computer. If you're trying to troubleshoot a hardware installation or a new device that's been added to your computer, you may want to look into that folder to gather more information about how the hardware in your computer is being used.